Welcome to Dracina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. This week on the podcast, it's just me and you folks, and today we are talking Cooperage. Did you know that Dracina Wines now has a wine club? We named it the Chalk Club. Draco is on our label, but Vegas was getting a little jealous, so we decided he deserved to be our club spokes dog. In Las Vegas, betting chalk means that you are betting on all of the favorites. We are betting that we are one of your favorite wineries, so we thought the name was apropos. The club is simple, yet a bit different than most. When you wager on us, we will ship you three bottles of wine twice a year, once in April and once in September. You can choose all red or mix of red and rosé. You immediately receive 15% off of all your wine purchases throughout the year, but what makes our club stand out is the progressive discount. Let your club membership ride into the next year. Your discount increases. Each year you parlay your membership, you receive an additional 5% off up to a planned maximum of 25%. Your club shipments are discounted to a flat $15, plus we'll cover your club shipping cost for your second shipment. That's $15 house money in a sure bet for you. So please head to our website, dracinawines.com, and find out all of the benefits of joining the Chalk Club and how to sign up. We've stacked the odds so that you can get our award-winning wines without breaking the bank. Today, we're getting back to science. So today, we are talking Cooperage. I love the science behind Cooperage. Do you guys even know what Cooperage is? Cooperage is such an important aspect in the winemaking process. And although it is typically known with red wines, it is also found in white wines. And it's a cool name, cool science, and pretty much even a cooler job. So if you love wine, you have to learn the science behind the wine barrel. Have you ever watched the show, How It's Made on Science Channel or Sports Science on ESPN? I love shows like that. I am totally mesmerized by the science behind things. To me, nothing occurs without science working in the background. If you read my blog, you know that there are several posts dedicated to science. There's a whole category that I talk about science. They say you have to stick to what you know and what you love, and for me, that's science. I'm going to talk in this podcast about cooperage. So cooperage is an art. Yes, it is definitely an art of making barrels. There is a lot of science behind the wood that is used to make the barrels because, you know, not any old wood can do. But once the wood is chosen, there's an art to the cutting, the bending, and the aging that the barrel, and that's just mind blowing to me. Purchasing an oak barrel today runs in the neighborhood of about $800 to about $1,400. If the winemaker is spending that much money on a single barrel, we are expecting an exceptional product. It is truly a special talent to craft a barrel. And in these next few moments we spend together, I'm going to discuss that process. We're going to start off with the science. So Mike and I both have worked in R&D, which is short for research and development. There is something special about walking into a store and seeing your product on the shelf. You take pride in it because a lot of time, thought and effort went into developing it. So when you work for a large corporation, you sign off on whatever you create while under their employment that it's theirs. So all you have left is the pride that you made that product. Not gonna lie, it might be a little embarrassing, but we have been known to walk into a store and see our product hidden behind, you know, one of those aisle displays and <clears throat> accidentally move the display in front of another product to show our product. So I wonder, do Coopers feel the same pride? I ponder, do Coopers taste a bottle of wine from a winery that they sold their barrel to and go, yeah, that's my work in there. It's incredible. The one time Mike and I were at a restaurant and the people next to us ordered our wine. 
and the feeling that comes over you, the pride, the enthusiasm, the, oh my God, people are actually buying something we put our heart and soul into. And we sat there kind of excitedly, but quietly, and we watched and we watched, and then we waited to see if they actually liked the product. And after he sipped our wine, he and his, I'm presuming, girlfriend or wife were like, holy cow, this is really good. We had to contain ourselves to not like dive over to the table and let them know that was our wine. But the feeling was so incredible. So back to wine barrels. There is a direct effect on the taste of the wine depending on the wine barrel chosen from the vintner. There are levels of toast. You have American oak, French oak, Hungarian oak barrels. So there is a lot to consider. But whatever barrel is chosen, I can guarantee that someone's heart and soul went into making it. Taking on the endeavor of creating, and I use creating purposely because making just isn't the correct term. A barrel is a long and arduous process. It is one that I would believe you have to love in order to choose to make it your profession. A process that once again incorporates art and science. So as with corks, right, just not any wood is going to do, right? It's very special. So Persis is also the preferred oak used for cooperage. The white oak contains the properties necessary to provide a tight cooperage while possessing the subtle fragrance that has become expected in the barrels. There are four types of wood found within a tree. Sapwood, which is typically the lighter in color, adds support to the tree and is used in the transportation of nutrients. Heartwood is typically darker because of the presence of tannins and the presence of cells that are no longer active. Springwood is what you would think. It's new growth. It is the rapid growth stage and consists of large cells but with very thin walls. And summer wood occurs when the spring wood rapid growth slows down. So these cells have thicker walls and are slightly more packed. Slow grown wood is slightly softer, making it more pliable than wood that has grown rapidly. Other than the growth rate differences, structural and chemical differences occur throughout the tree. Oak lactones and vanillin also vary across the wood. American oak tends to possess less extractable phenolics than European oaks and tannin levels vary slightly. So the use of different oak to create the barrels will deliver different results to the winemaker. As with everything else, all wood is not created equally. Not all wood can be made into a barrel. Wine cooperage requires specific properties. It must have vessels and fibers that run parallel to the length of the trunk with no waves within the growth pattern and cannot have vessels that intertwine. These would lead to flaws in that barrel. So the wood must possess strength and resilience and lack of any fault that could cause leakage. Extremely important is the lack of any off odors. I mean, you're not going to make a barrel that has an off odor because that odor is then going to become present in the wine itself. So the cooper also likes to see large rays and tyloses. Rays act as the channel for the flow of water and nutrients. Due to the way the cooper cuts the wood to create the stave of the barrel, the large rays make it difficult for the wine to diffuse out of the sides of the barrel while providing flexibility and resilience. Tyloses develop when the tree is stressed or as the sap wood develops into the heartwood. These are plugs to prevent further damage to the plant. It's like arteriosclerosis of the tree. But unlike arteriosclerosis in us, these are beneficial to the tree. For the cooper, it means no leaks. Tyloses allow for the watertight and airtight containers 
These features are necessary in a superior quality cooperage wood. So let's go back to the concept of research and development. Did you ever think about how much was involved in making a wine barrel? Or let's not even go wine barrel. Let's just think any product. You walk into the store and you grab that box of wheat thins, okay? There was research going into making that product, making it taste the way it tastes. Years, possibly, before wheat thins was created. And then... On a day-to-day -day basis, there's more research going on to how to tweak that, how to maybe make it less expensive for them and not increase your cost, how to make it healthier, how to change the flavor from original to roasted pepper, whatever. Okay? When you go into that store and you pick up your favorite product, there is so much behind the scenes that happens before you have ever hits the shelves and people just typically don't consider that. So the research and development, the scaling up of the product, the sensory analysis, the microbial analysis, which you know was my favorite thing since that's what I did. Let's not forget the package design and the product placement. Did you know that products at eye level in a store cost the company more than lower level shelves? Companies pay the stores to place their products. So the wine barrel is an amazing product and it takes a lot of behind the scenes to get it to the wine maker. So the wine barrel itself has lots of parts to it. In its most basic form, it has staves held together by hoops. The hoops are held together by rivets and there is a bung hole for access. But there is so much more than the basic that goes into the production of a wine barrel. So the side staves are typically chosen from wood that is a minimum of 100 years old with a diameter between 45 and 60 centimeters. Larger trees are predominantly used for the head staves. Once chosen, the trees are cut to the desired length and split into quarters. It is imperative that the planks are uniform in thickness and are cut parallel to the rays. Sapwood is removed, but the wood next to it is preferred. So stave length, width, and thickness all depend on the desired barrel volume. This is important in determining the rate of maturation. The thinner the stave, the earlier the maturation. Once cut, the staves and headpieces are stacked together and seasoned in the open air. Natural seasoning can take up to three years. There is also the option to kiln dry, but it is generally thought that natural drying gives more of a pleasant woody vanilla character. Kiln drying lends itself to a more resinous characteristic. Since there is always a concern with microbiological contamination, it has to become customary to combine both air and kiln drying. So this tends to provide the most protection from the undesired fungal infection found in the higher moisture content. But if it takes three years before they can get that barrel to you, that's going to add to the cost, similar to how it takes two years minimum to get a red wine into bottle. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. After all the integral parts of the barrel are made, but before beginning the assembly, each piece is thoroughly inspected for knots, cracks, and other structural faults, because any of these faults is going to cause a problem with that barrel. The cooper then sorts through all of the staves to find the appropriate number needed for the barrel. These staves then get dressed, and there are four steps involved in dressing a barrel. First is listing. This is tapers the large ends of the staves to give the basic shape. The amount of listing is dependent on the length of the barrel. Backing is the chiseling of the wood from the ends of the staves. The third is hollowing, which is chiseling the wood in the center of the staves and this is what allows for the bending of the wood to create that barrel shape. And the fourth process is jointing, using a tool called a plane along the inner edge of the sides of the stave 
to install a bevel. This is a highly skilled job because you move along the stave, the angles change. So the bevel, again, dependent on the height of the barrel, is maximal at the center and least at the ends. Jointing is responsible for the tightness between the adjacent staves. So now, once the dressing is completed, the staves are raised. This means that all of the staves that will make up the barrel, which could be between 28 and 32, depending on its size, are placed together in an upright circle, using temporary hoops to support them. These hoops are then forced down to force the staves to begin to bend. So they're taking that wood and they're shoving these temporary hoops down, 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 and it's forcing that bending of that wood. So it is then placed above an open fire to soften the wood. During this period, the wood is either sprayed with water, steamed prior to being placed over the fire, or it could actually be submerged in hot water. These processes are done to soften the wood and this limits the cracking that can form during the process. So once softening has been completed, the staves are pulled together while positioning temporary hoops to hold the staves in place until additional heating removes all of the moisture and sets the staves in their desired curved shape. So once they're dry, they're kind of stuck in that position. So it's kind of like when you were a little kid and your mom would say, don't stick your tongue out, it'll end up like that. Well, that's what happens. We're going to wet this wood, we're going to force it into this shape, and we're going to dry it, and now it's going to be stuck in that shape. So this process is called setting. Now comes the toasting. Toasting is the additional heating that has been around since above, about the 19th century. This is what produces the sensory characteristics of the wood. Light toasting leaves the wood with its natural oaky vanilla and coconut aromas. Medium toasting provides the vanilla roasted or a caramel character. And heavy toast gives the surface layers of a smoky, spicy aspect. So depending on what the winemaker is looking to get out of the wine he or she is creating, they're going to choose a specific toast level. So it's interesting that there is no industry-wide standard defining light, medium, or heavy toasting. So a heavy toast from Cooperage A might be very different and probably is very different from heavy toasting of Cooperage B. So you need to pay attention to who the Cooperage house is that you are buying your barrels from. You might like one more than the other. Consequently, there's a lot of choices that you can make to impact the wine you're creating. So some winemakers might take heavy toast from Cooper A and medium toast from Cooper B and light toast from Cooper C. And when you're adding them all together, you get that complexity that evolves in the wine. So after toasting to the chosen level, the cooper will place a bevel on the inner surface of the stave ends. Chiming, which is preparing the ends for the head pieces, involves planing the ends of the staves, the chime, and cutting a concave groove slightly below it, which is the howl. An even deeper cut into the howl creates this craze and provides a place where the heading will fit. The outer surface is planed to become smooth, while the inner surface, we actually want it to be rough, and this helps to promote wine clarification. Then we need the bung hole. So they bore the hole so that we have access, so that we can put the wine in and we can get the wine out. Any temporary hoops are replaced with permanent ones. This usually includes two chime hoops located just below the head of the barrel, and two bilge hoops positioned approximately one-third from the ends, and a set of quarter hoops placed about one-fourth away from the heads. The heads are then chosen and prepped. The head itself actually consists of 12 to 16 pieces. Unlike the staves, they are straight and do not need to be beveled and receive no toasting. They are sealed to prevent leakage and sawed. 
the bottom head is inserted first and then it is inverted to have the top head aligned. Finally, the cooper will hammer the hoops tight. This forces the staves into place and closes most of the cracks. After soaking for about 24 hours in water, the barrel then becomes leak proof. And there you have it. That's how we make wine barrels. This honestly is really only a very brief look at into the art and the science of, of making a wine barrel. But I mean, you could go on to days and days and study how to make a barrel. And it's years and years of practice before you can be a cooperage. If you want to find out more of how to do it, there is a video by Sourry Cooperage on YouTube. That's spelled S-A-U-R-Y Cooperage. Just uh, Google them on YouTube and they'll pop up and they will show you a nice video of how the process is made. And on my blog for the podcast, there will be a picture of all of the parts of the barrel. So that's it. Barrel making, cooperage, and impact on the wine. Hope you have a great week. Slancha. Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Google, and Periscope as at Dracina Wines. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud, or email us at dracinawines.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find us more easily. We are found on all of your favorite aggregators. To subscribe easily to iTunes, go to bit.ly forward slash Dracina podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Dracina podcast. And that's a capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. Please check out our award-winning wines and find out about our wine club at DracinaWines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Slancha.